Hello everyone. Welcome to Asniti. I am Shekhar Tomar. We are extremely delighted to have Mr. Montexing Eluvalia with us today. He is a public policy expert and has worked in various positions within the government of India, the IMF and the World Bank. He also served as a deputy chairman of the planning commission between 2004 and 2014. He is a Padma Bhushan awardee and has recently written a book backstage recounting his experiences and learnings about the public policy domain. Welcome to Earth Meeti, Montek. Thank you. Nice Thank to you be on your, your show. I'll start with a very broad question, uh, which is uh, basically asking you to draw upon your experiences working not just in India but also multilateral institutions, where you looked at the growth story for different countries. So, if you have to summarize and talk about the key ingredients, what would do those key ingredients be? Well, I think two. Two sorts of, uh, if you like, uh, elaborations on the basic growth story. Yeah, the basic growth story is just a consequence of development. I mean, not being developed means having a very low income, which means having a very low GDP, and wanting to develop means having a larger GDP. So that in the 1950s, that's how everybody viewed growth. But I think over time, people began to realize that. Uh, Growth cannot just be uh, a single metric of performance. Uh, there are lots of other things you have to worry about. And for example, we coined in India the phrase "inclusive growth," and the idea was that uh, growth should be benefiting everybody. And there are different ways of looking at that. I mean, is it going to the poor also? Is it going to different regions? Are women being excluded? Are different castes being? You know, you can you can have any number of things. But the bottom line is that on a suitable definition of inclusiveness, the growth should be broad-based. So that's one. I think the second thing that has happened over time is that, you know, growth. Uh, a lot of what pushes growth today may be hampering growth either in other countries or for the future, and that's the whole environmental issue, which has now become absolutely top level. And you know we reflected that in our own uh, process because I think in the eleventh plan, which was the first five years of the UPA period, uh, we we set the target as inclusive growth, and that is really what uh, in the international debate and discussion, certainly in the last twenty years, those have been the dominant concerns. Now, how you achieve that is another set of issues on which you know opinions vary. Things some things become more fashionable than others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, based on your understanding, what are those or key fashionable issues? What are the key ingredients? Well, in my mind, uh, you know, when I was a student in college, uh, the focus used to be on investment. I mean, you're not developed because you have low investment, and you should increase investment, and then you will get growth. Uh, I think over time, a lot of this push for investment. Took place in the public sector, and it was just assumed that public sector investment is as good as private sector investment. But you know, over time, there was a recognition that efficiency in public sector investment is much below what it should be. So that led to the questioning that you know, should you be so exclusively pro public sector as we were? I mean, we, for example. Uh, Reserved certain areas entirely for the public sector, which really meant that even when the private sector is willing to invest, you wouldn't let them invest. And I think the opinion changed around that that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, in the West, there was a more extreme version of this, which is just that government role should disappear or it should shrink. Now, this is nonsense because even in the West, government has a very, very big role. Only thing is, government doesn't do things that private sector can do best. I mean, in the United States, most of the infrastructure was built by the government. Uh, so I would say that we need to, we we certainly need to recognize that the role of government in India has to expand rather than contract, because the size of government expenditure as a percent of GDP in India is much lower than it is in other countries. So the idea of small government doesn't make sense for India. There are a lot more things that government should be doing, but those are things, in my view, in infrastructure, in health, in education, not in production. So that is the way I look at it. I, the moment you recognize that, 
as far as the private sector is concerned, I mean, you don't want to simply substitute a government monopoly by a private sector monopoly. So the private sector can be efficient only if it operates in a competitive environment. Now that poses its own challenges, that what is a competitive environment? And competition is not just internal, competition is also external. Uh, so that's the whole question of uh, to what extent do you protect your private sector from global competition? Uh, and that's been an issue in uh, Indian policy, still is an issue in Indian policy. But I would say that uh, I subscribe to the view that we, you need a larger role for government uh, than it has at the moment, but not the kind of role it's been having traditionally. There are well-defined areas where it needs to do more. It should do more by essentially raising resources through efficient taxation. Yes, so if I may over. ask you a question here on the level of government expenditure, uh, is this statement qualified even given the level of per capita income? Because we see that over time as per capita income goes up. Uh -huh. Yes, I think government when you spend more. Yeah, when you when you recognize that our per capita income is low, then the extent to which uh, our government expenditure is low would get moderated. But you know, opinion on this varies because uh, some research that has been done suggests that uh, the tax ratio in India could be raised at least three to four percentage points beyond what it currently is based on other countries. I've seen other reports that say that's not true and that India is actually bang on the line, uh, sort of an average performer. But if you accept the fact that uh, tax ratio in India ideally ought to be, say, three percentage points more, that three percentage points more uh, could get reflected in a somewhat lower fiscal deficit and a higher level of expenditure. And certainly there are areas where we need a higher level of expenditure. But a lot of the increase in expenditure that we need must come by getting rid of uh, non-productive or dysfunctional uh, subsidies, which are now littering the system. And that's a tough one to do politically, you know, because, I mean, whenever you try to remove a subsidy, it becomes a politically contentious issue. So I remember uh, last year you had an article in Mint where you were specifically talking about fiscal deficit, which was joint for the state and the centre government. And the expenditure was much larger relative to the household savings in India. So effectively, you mentioned that we are basically borrowing from abroad just to fund the government expenditure. And you mentioned that going forward, we probably need to go on a fiscal consolidation. Yes, I, I, think, I think the conventional view today would be uh, that if you look at the size of the Indian fiscal deficit, for that you have to look at the center and the states put together. And frankly, you also need to measure that correctly so that off-budget items are also included. One of the problems for a long time has been that the center would do a lot of off-budget borrowing that didn't show up uh, in the budget. It won't show up in the current fiscal, but it will show up sometime in the future, probably. Well, it will show up sometime in the future, but you know, all policy discussion is about the current. And I think there are ways of making sure that you can't do off-budget borrowing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with off-budget borrowing by a public sector enterprise, which you're treating like a competitive corporation. But an off-budget borrowing, let's say, which used to happen by the Food Corporation of India, which is meant to be a loss-making entity, because it's buying wheat at high prices and selling them at a subsidized price, that should be funded overtly through the budget. And if we have to borrow to meet that funding, that borrowing should be shown as government borrowing, whereas it, used, it began to be shown as food corporation borrowing. And that I think the government has corrected that. I mean, uh, our present finance minister, a couple of years ago, did this clean up for the central government. But in the state governments, that's not true. There's a lot of off-budget borrowing uh, that goes on. I mean, for example, all the, the deficits and losses of the electricity boards are not shown as deficits of the state government. And the only reason that banks are lending to the electricity boards is because they think that somehow or the other the state government will pay. So if you take the combined deficit of the center and the state put together, and you include this off-budget item, it's very large. It's certainly more than twice what it is in other developing countries. 
Now, you know, this would not matter if there was a huge amount of savings. But the fact of the matter is that savings are also limited. And I did some comparison that if you look at, you know, there are three sectors in the economy. I mean, there's the government, there's the corporate sector, and then there's the household sector. Both the government and the household sector, taken as a group, are net dissavers. That is, they spend more than they actually uh, save, okay? Uh, and they draw upon the savings of the household sector. Now, the savings of the household sector are measured by the Reserve Bank of India. But you know, at the moment, uh, as a percent of GDP, the saving of the household sector is not more than about 11% or so. I, I don't have the latest figures with me. But the combined deficit of the center and the state governments is almost that, which really means that this saving is not available for investment uh, in the rest of the economy. And this hasn't always been the case. I mean, there was a time in the mid-2000s when the combined deficit had shrunk and the investment by household sector in private sector were were larger. much larger. And that difference is what went into investment and it contributed to the growth process. So I think we do need, we need to address this issue. And it's not easy to address, let's put it that way. So given the current global environment, I know this article you mentioned uh, was written last year. And since at that point of time, we were expecting growth to pick up globally and then uh, maybe India would hitch its wagon to the global economy. But since then, at least in the developed economies, we are seeing a slowdown also because of the action of the central banks over there. So it seems uh, fiscal consolidation has to take some time. Well, I have no doubt that fiscal consolidation will take time. I mean, uh, I don't think you can magically achieve fiscal consolidation by collapsing expenditure or raising taxes. But, you know, I think we need a medium-term understanding and we need to keep going back to it. Because if you look at our medium-term projections, and I'm now going uh, before this government, when the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act was introduced, I mean, we did very well between 2004 and 2007, collapsing the deficit. After the financial crisis of 2008, we expanded the deficit. That was a conscious decision, and in my view, the correct decision. We expanded in 2008. We kept it expanded in 2009. There was a clear intention and stated intention that in 2010, it should start going down. It never did. So 2010 was too high. In the last couple of years of the UPA, it remained a little bit too high. The present government also said that we are going to reduce the fiscal deficit. But I mean, and they did reduce it a little bit, but nowhere near what it was meant to be. So I think we are badly off track. So just to ask a question here, is there some responsibility for the state finances as well, or the FRBM only covers the center? No, I think the states, I mean, the, the, the problem there, quite honestly, is that the states have also passed an FRBM. I have some problems with how we are interpreting that. But technically, the states cannot borrow without the explicit consent of the government of India. Okay, So the state deficit is automatically under control. But what they do is they pass on the deficit through their subsidiaries and get it financed through non-bank finance companies or the banks. Uh, that doesn't require the explicit approval of the central government. Okay, So there's a kind of a spilling over of the deficit beyond the area of control. And somehow I think that has to be brought in. Now, part of the problem there is that our banks and even some of our non-bank organizations somehow believe that lending to a state government is safe because they think that, well, the center or the state government will somehow make sure that they repay. And as a result, more lending takes place than should. Otherwise, the state governments are limited because they cannot borrow without the consent of the central government. Now, that doesn't apply to the center. The center can borrow whatever it wants. If it exceeds the fiscal deficit, it just has to tell the parliament why it exceeded the fiscal deficit. Now, you know, in other countries, there's very strong realization that exceeding the fiscal deficit imposes costs on the country, 
either the inflation goes up or uh, private sector gets squeezed out, you get low growth, you get low employment. And the public debate recognizes that this is happening because you bust the fiscal deficit. We don't have that discipline, maybe not that understanding. I mean, if the government goes and announces tomorrow that in order to help A, B, and C, we are going to spend X thousand crores, and of course the fiscal deficit will go up, uh, I don't think there'll be any criticism. And I think, you know, this is the big difference between, let's say, what you saw in Britain under the Very former sad. Prime Minister Liz Truss. I mean, she did something quite contrary to what uh, any sensible economist would have recommended. And the market punishment, punishment was immense and immediate. And public also saw that, look, this is why things are going wrong. We don't have such a sophisticated response, not just response, but we don't have such a sophisticated public understanding. Or market punishment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go back again to the growth story. And I, I guess you were part of the 1991 reforms in the sense that you saw them from very close. Uh, so my sense is a lot of low-hanging fruits were picked over the last few decades, uh, the last two decades specifically. And so I'm quoting from your recounting of the discussion about the 1991 reforms. You wrote it uh, in the chapter in India Transformed. You said, much has been achieved in the 25 years since the reforms began, but as the old problems were solved, new ones have surfaced and solving these needs new initiatives that will have to be as far reaching as the original reforms were. What reforms or what strong reforms are you talking about here? Yeah, that's a, it's always tough getting your own stuff thrown back at you. But you're right about one thing, and that is in, in 1991, I would call the reforms we did, they're very important, but they were low hanging fruit in the sense it was pretty obvious and the reason it was obvious was that the problems were being created by bad policies. So all you had to do was abolish the policies. I mean, for example, it was a silly policy to say that, you know, we will not allow private sector to invest where they want to invest because this industry is very important and therefore it's reserved for the public sector. I mean, that was a silly policy and we drastically reduced the range of industries that were covered. Similarly, Im imposing industrial licensing was a silly policy. We got rid of that. Lots of other such examples. Now, I think, and the economy reacted. Uh, we did other things also. We, we improved the financial system and allowed it to develop. I think all of that took too long, in my view. I mean, we moved in the right direction. But, you know, the compulsions of democratic politics made it more likely that the government acted slowly. Uh, I'm not a great believer in big bang reforms that we should have done everything in the first two years. But I think we took too long. I mean, what we achieved in 30 years, we should have achieved in 15. That was not possible. Too bad. A missed opportunity. But, you know, once the economy began to uh, respond to the freedom that it had gained, I think there were the performance was pretty good in the sense that the average growth rate uh, got a bit unleashed. There's a lot of debate on uh, to what extent uh, was it due to the reforms or not. I have in the slightest doubt that without those reforms, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, the problem really is that that was what brought us from being a low-income country over the threshold to the, being the bottom of the middle-income countries. Now, there's a lot of literature that says that, you know, when you get into the middle-income range, you, you keep developing, but you run into new constraints, which are, if you like, qualitatively different. Uh, they're not the result of bad policy, but they're the result of not having built the kind of institutions necessary to support a higher growth rate when the economy has become more advanced and more sophisticated. Okay. In the Indian context, I would say right now, uh, the critical reforms really are the following. And these are long term in the sense that we should, first of all, see a clear articulation that that's what we want to do and diffuse the political opposition uh, to that kind of thing. Uh, 
And then we should say, well, we were not going to do it tomorrow, but it's going to get done over the next three or four years. Uh, so that when it's done, uh, nobody says that, how come you're suddenly doing it? Okay. Now, what are they? I still think that in the financial world, although I think the banking system has improved in many ways, uh, and the most importantly, we now have a very substantial private sector banking uh, sector within the overall banking set, which is actually quite efficient and doing quite well. The public sector banking system seems to have got over the problems it had recently, but that largely because government infused a lot of capital into the banks and they wrote off a lot of loans. We don't really know yet whether the quality of lending that the public sector banks will do in future, uh, which has the, the quantity has to increase if growth has to accelerate. We don't know whether the quality will actually be better so they won't report, repeat the problems that they had in previous years. I think in order to improve that quality, some fundamental change is necessary. Some people would say that, look, uh, you should just privatize the whole public sector banking system. You know, my own feeling is that, uh, and the government has said they want to privatize two banks. They haven't privatized any of them so far. It's going to be quite difficult uh, to privatize two banks because unless you're handing over the bank completely, if you retain a certain percentage, which seems to be the intention, I'm not sure that you will get too many people willing to do that. They would do that if it was the State Bank of India. But if you pick two of the weakest public sector banks and give someone uh, a large stake in it, I don't think you'll find too many borrowers coming in. I think on the other hand, what we could do, which has been on the agenda for some time, we should get rid of dual control of the public sector banks. You see, today, it's not widely realized that the public sector banks are controlled by both the Reserve Bank of India and the finance ministry. And to my mind, this is totally dysfunctional. What so we should you give it? The Reserve Bank. I mean, the Reserve Bank should have exactly the same power over public sector banks that it does over private sector banks. Now, what does this mean? You know, when the Reserve Bank is convinced that a private sector bank management is not, I mean, is not actually doing the right thing, heading in the wrong direction, they can actually change the chief executive or prevent him being extend, her being extended. They don't have that power in the public sector bank. So as long as the chief executive is convinced that he or she is doing what the finance ministry likes, there's really no reason why they should listen to the Reserve Bank at all. And frankly, it also leads to poor supervision by the Reserve Bank because they know that they're not going to be held responsible. So I think I would say that by all means, privatize these two public sector banks if you can. But the most important thing is that our better public sector banks should be regulated by the same organization and not dual regulated by the finance ministry as well as uh, uh, the Reserve Bank. That's a very big change. And I think if we do that, I'd be delighted. And I think people would also sense that as a structural change. And let me say that uh, I don't think there would be any public opposition to it. Okay, The only opposition would be from the bureaucracy within the finance ministry, because there's an entire division that looks after public sector banks. Now, let me say this is not a new idea. It's certainly not my idea. See, when the Narsimham Committee, Narsimham 1 report was submitted, uh, two of the members, I think Manu Shroff and somebody else, have suggested that dual control should end. The banking division should just be abolished. What that goes this? back in 1991. Okay. Okay. Subsequently, uh, P.J. Nayak, who during that period was a joint secretary in the Ministry of Finance uh, when I was secretary, uh, a first-rate officer, later on became chairman of Axis Bank. He was appointed, I think, by the present government in 2014 or so uh, to make some recommendations on how we can uh, improve banking uh, system. He made a series of recommendations. And one of his recommendations also was getting rid of dual control. Hasn't happened. I think uh, Urjit Patel, when he was governor, 
he is governor appointed by the present government, he also felt very strongly that dual control should be got rid of. Now, this is not a political issue. I mean, I don't believe that on the political side, the proposition that private public sector banks should not have dual control. I'm not saying they shouldn't have control. They should have control by the Reserve Bank of India. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and personally, I think if we do it, it's a stroke of the pen reform. It doesn't require too many other changes. Okay, That should be done. Um, I personally feel that we have now, we need to think about uh, what should be our policy towards the extent of foreign competition that we need to subject the Indian industry to. Now, this is actually a little controversial, and not everybody has the same view, but I'm very clear about it. Uh, some people, it is true that around the world in the last three or four years, there has been some retreat from the notion of free and open competition. The Americans have brought in this concept of fair trade rather than free trade. And that has become more complicated by the tensions between the United States and China, because that has introduced something other than trade. The Chinese have grown so rapidly that they're, really in a, they're, they're certainly in a position to threaten the United States becoming the largest economy in the world, not the highest per capita income, the largest economy. I mean, they have a much larger population. But you know, economy alone is not the only thing. They are explicitly saying that we are going to threaten the, uh, the primacy of the US militarily and also technologically. That has led the US into saying that, look, they can only do this because they get access to our technology. And the US says they get access to it in unfair means. So a lot of sanctions and indirect uh, denial of opportunities being extended to China. So the world is getting a little fragmented. Okay, What should be India's position? In my view, uh, we are small players in the global market. Nobody views us as a threat. We are still more protected than other developing countries. And here's the critical issue. If you have high levels of tariff, what does it do? I think a high level of tariff makes your exports uncompetitive. This is the fundamental thing that in too much of the public debate, high tariffs are seen as a view of protect, protecting domestic industry. And obviously, people want to protect domestic industry because it sounds good. But high tariffs protect the industries on which tariffs are high, but they reduce the competitiveness of even those same industries where exports are concerned. Do you think it's more of a concern because of the rise in the GVCs? Rise of? Global value chains, the GVCs. Well, the need to reduce tariffs is especially important because of the rise of global value chain. Because, you know, uh, what is a global value chain? A global value chain implies that products are going to be produced wherever the production is most competitive, and they're going to cross national boundaries many times. Uh, going to other places where the second stage of production will take place. Now, I think our government has said quite rightly that we want to become a part of global value chains. But, you know, in some people's thinking, the concept of global value chain seems to be that the entire value chain will be in India. That you're going to start with chips and then go to designing the chips. Uh, the fact is a global value chain is going to mean products will be located in different parts of the world and they must move freely across borders. Now, if India's tariffs are high compared to other countries, anyone locating a global value chain would be well advised to avoid India because everyone else has much, much lower tariffs and indeed they have free trade operations. See, I was, I was very enthusiastic that uh, the, when the government said that uh, instead of looking east, which was the earlier slogan, we must act east. And we had an opportunity to join the RCEP uh, a year or so ago. And it took six years of negotiation. And I thought that, well, after that much negotiation, we are going to join. But as it turned out, there was a lot of political pressure uh, and the government succumbed to it. Now, I think Indian industry was very concerned uh, that China is a member of RCEP and we don't want to lower tariffs vis-a-vis -vis China, okay? 
Now, frankly, we had a long time. It's not that we were going to lower tariffs immediately. And I think looking ahead, there's no reason why we can't be competitive vis-a-vis -vis China. Because if we want to be a major player in the world, we cannot say that we are going to be a major player providing we don't play against China and uh, these other countries, right? Uh, yes, there are some reasons why we are not competitive, which are domestic. And we should be, be able to undertake corrective steps domestic. Some of that we are now doing. Uh, you know, all this logistics and Gati Shakti and so forth. They're good, good steps. But, you know, entering RCEP is what would put competitive pressure. And if you don't join these organizations, you'll find a world where free trade agree agreements will exist all over the place and we're going to be outside. Now, if we are, for example, afraid of China, because we think, or some of our industry thinks that China plays unfair, Maybe we should join the free trade agreement led by Japan, which is the comprehensive partnership where China is not a member, okay? It would give us a foot in an area of free trade which is very important. We need to ask the question, what is the degree of openness we need to remain competitive in the modern world? And I would say that uh, we should have a clear medium-term objective that India's average tariff levels will fall to the average tariff levels, let's say, in Asian countries. Okay. Our present levels are... So you want to give a timeline for hmm? that? Oh, I would say if we do that over five years, it's not bad. I would even be willing to do it over 10 years. It's a typical, you know, we will delay the benefits, but at least a line will have been, a direction will have been set. Today, there are too many people who seem to be acting as if we can continue this for the next 30 years. Now, that's totally wrong in my view. So that's, that's a new institutional issue that we need to address. You know, related to, the, to, to that integration is the notion that, you know, tariffs are not regarded as the only basis for international negotiations. There are many other considerations. Yeah, I was coming to non-tariff measures. Yes. So behind the border exactly behind the border measures now this is more complicated because let me say it's very clear one can one can make arguments that uh, this is being invented by the developed countries uh, in order to as it were give them an advantage true i mean that is true but the point is that the there's no reason why we should think that we can't meet those standards and if you want integration, I'm afraid you're going to have to meet those standards. And we used to make those points. So these standards would be labor, environment? There would be labor, there would be environment, there'd be phytosanitary. I mean, these are the critical ones. And you know, on phytosanitary standards, I mean, uh, the difficulty I tell you is that there are lots of people who think that uh, why should we uh, accept higher phytosanitary standards than we think are necessary for our level of development, okay? And I can, I mean, one can make an argument, but then there are gains and losses. If the advantage of uh, accepting these standards is seamless integration with a huge market in the rest of the world, we need to count that as a positive. Not accepting the standards doesn't mean that our access to the markets will not be affected. Because other countries, if they're joining these standards, I mean, their imports will be preferred. So I think we need, we need some serious thinking uh, on this issue, which I hope we'll get. I mean, you know. Uh, you already gave 10 years for reducing the tariffs. For this one? Oh, the same period. Look, same I, think, period. I think on this, uh, when I said 10 years, I said, as opposed to doing nothing. I mean, I would give five years. That's what we should say. But, you know, I would say that if, if people find that five years, oh, let's do it over 10 years, we would have lost five years. But if you don't even have a debate, we'll be where we are now, 30 years from now. And that would be a disaster. Well, just a counter-argument on these other uh, non-tariff measures. What if the goalpost changes tomorrow? Because... If the Very rationale... Well, I'll tell you why. I mean, the critical thing, that's why we should be in the, in the FTA. See, if a goalpost changes tomorrow and you're in the FTA, they can't change it. 
If you're outside the FDA, they can keep changing it. They don't have to consult you. This is the big difference. Had we joined RCEP a year ago, any further changes would require our consent. So in a way, we would have a veto uh, on that ability to change the goalposts. We don't have that veto now. So even in terms of non-tariff measures, it would give us benefit I to join early so. rather than... I believe so. You know, the, we have to... I, I think the whole attitude in India on, uh, on tariff negotiations has not, I think, been uh, founded on a fundamental assumption that integration with the world gives a huge number of benefits. The assumption is that access to the world gives benefits, but access to your market is a disadvantage. Therefore, we try to maximize the access we get and minimize the access we give. That's fine if we can get away with it. You can't get away with it anymore. And the truth is, if we had succeeded in our strategy, and we were 10% of the world market, they'd listen to us. We are less than 2%. So the question is, you don't have bargaining power. And if other countries are happily joining, what credibility do we have in saying that, look, we can't do this, even though Indonesia is willing to do it, Malaysia is willing to do it, Thailand is willing to do it. I think people will say that, look, are you trying to become as big as these countries in terms of per capita income or not? So if you are going to become as strong as these countries, they're all above us in per capita income, then what's the harm in joining? And I have not seen, I mean, the lead, lead in this area should be taken by Indian industry. Indian industry should be telling the government that we want you to do this because we are confident that we can actually compete. And frankly, look at what happened in 1991. All this nonsense was being talked about at that time. You're lowering the tariffs, barbaz ho jayega desh, looting the country, all this nonsense, right? What has happened since then is the ratio of exports to GDP has more than doubled. And earlier it was either flat or falling. So we've learned something, that the, these closed economy policies are wrong. And I'm pushing a bit more on it, but there would be pockets of industry would, which would gain by this policy change versus some others who would lose. Maybe it's the losers who have a bigger bargain. Absolutely, power. but no, let me put it this way. Uh, losers will adjust. Losers, when they see the change, will actually adjust. Now, in a structural change, you know, every job is not going to survive. I mean, after all, when, when taxis were introduced into India, all the Tongawalas resisted it because they said, you know, this will be bad for us. But the fact of the matter is that if people are going to move around, they're not going to move in Tongas. And if you force them to move in Tongas, that they just couldn't move. And there's not that much difference between that example and this one. If you give time, if you give a clear signal, if you provide support for industries to need, that need to adjust, they will adjust. After all, that's the logic of the GST, after all. You know, when the GST, which I think is a very good reform, although it could have been handled better. Lots of the small fellows said, no, we can't do uploading computers, only big firms can do it, etc., etc. But they're all learning and doing it. So related to this, and this connects to a lot of work that you're doing these days on sustainability issues. How do you think the discussion about climate change and sustainability has changed in the last 10, 15 years, specifically for countries like India? Do you think this trade-off between growing versus uh, climate has changed? Like, do yeah. the technological changes made it more feasible for countries like India to participate in this discussion? Well, look, clearly in climate, India has changed its own position. In fact, uh, uh, when the COP26 was happening a year ago in Glasgow, uh, the official position was resisting any agreement, official at the, at the official level, there's a lot of resistance to accepting any commitment to reduce emissions. But I think the Prime Minister overruled that objection and he made a commitment that we are going to go to net zero by 2070. So that was, I think that change was appreciated, that is a good change. But you know, it's one thing to make the slogan, uh, then the next question is, how are we going to uh, implement that. 
That's not just a problem for India, because even the European countries, the big change in climate change discussions that has taken place is that the earlier years, the argument of India used to be that, look, you can't develop without energy. I mean, the argument of cutting down energy because you don't want to develop, you live in a poorer location, you control your greed, those kinds of things, that's not acceptable because we also want to develop. And if you're going to need energy, you're going to have emissions. That has changed because it is now possible to have energy which doesn't generate emissions. So I think this is something which developing countries recognize. And there are still lots of problems, but it is now possible to have renewable energy, which is as cheap, if not cheaper, than conventional energy. The only difference is that renewable energy at the moment, I mean, is peaked in the sense that you get solar energy for seven, eight hours, eight, hour, eight to ten hours in the day. You don't get it at night. So what do you do? I mean, you can't have an electricity system with peak supplies. You need to supplement that with, say, battery storage. Battery storage will add to the cost. And at the present moment, the cost of electricity, including battery storage, is not cheaper than conventional uh, energy. But, you know, battery storage costs are going down all over the world. People are working on it. And hopefully, that just as solar energy costs went down, we can hope that battery uh, costs will also go down. Once that happens, nobody is stopping you from developing. Nobody is stopping you from increasing your energy consumption. Just make sure that the energy is renewable energy and not uh, fossil energy. And the scope for doing that is very large. And even in use, for example, in the entire uh, transport sector, people are using fossil energy directly in the form of petrol, diesel, etc. Now, if we can move to EVs, electric vehicles, and if the electricity used for the electric vehicles is not coal-based, but clean, green, you can get rid of a whole lot of emissions that come from the transport sector. Now, you know, we have said net zero by 2070, which is almost 50 years. I personally think that we should translate that, and that's what I've been arguing in the paper that you mentioned uh, with my colleague uh, Utkarsh Patel. It's a joint paper. Uh, and we've been saying that, look, in order to make this a meaningful discussion, let us translate the long-term target into a 10-year target with granular detail on what you're going to do in each sector. Now, if you look at it that way, it's quite possible, in fact, very likely, that emissions in the first instance will increase because we have a lot of solar, I mean, uh, power plants which are in the pipeline. But, you know, if we make the decision that, look, all future power plants will be renewable, no more other than what's in the pipeline, no more power plants based on coal, then we can expect to see a decline in emissions uh, from the power sector, which is accounts for 70% of the total emissions so far. Okay. And that means we are able to say that, look, emissions will peak maybe in 2032, 33, and then start going down. And then we can check whether we are moving in line with that target. See, otherwise, uh, net zero by 2070, how do you measure whether you're getting to net zero by 2070? It's a good target, but it needs to be made you need some sector short specific time. and granular. I see. So you need some shorter term goal posts as you go along. The yes. Way. And also we, that will focus attention on policy. I mean, for example, you know, one of the important things in EVs, electric vehicles, is there must be adequate charging capacity, charging stations. Where are you charging it, etc. Now, all over the world, lots of experiments are taking place. Uh, in London, for example, if you go down any of these streets, Many of the lamp posts, the, the electric company has put a charging station at the bottom of it. You can bring your car there and plug it in and it will charge over the next four or five years. We need to do the same thing. Now, that has to be done not by the automotive stations, not by the company, not even by the gas stations. It has to be done by BSES in Delhi. So I think we need to galvanize uh, a number of people. In our paper, 
we make the point that, you know, the number of people that have to collaborate in this is very large. Across ministries, from the center to the state level, etc. That's what they call a whole of the economy approach. Now, historically, we've not been very good at achieving these things, but this is the new challenge. We must do it. I'll move a little bit away from uh, public policy. I mean, the question I'm going to ask is also a little bit about public policy, but it relates also to your personal life in the sense that there are very few lateral entrants in the government uh, and having uh, an accomplished career like you. So the question is, do you think uh, there is a need for having more lateral entry into top positions in the government? And if there is a need, how to go about it, changing the current... No, I'm quite structure? clear that there is a need. Um, we need lateral entry. You know, for my generation, the lateral entry was limited to economists. And I'm not the only one. There were several very distinguished economists who made major contributions, came in from outside. Uh, in the Reserve Bank also, I mean, C. Rangarajan came in from academic life, from the Indian Institute of Management. In government, we had uh, Vijay Kelka, Bimal Jalan, Rakesh Mohan, uh, Arvind Virmani, Shankar Acharya, quite a, quite a few. I mean, I, I don't want to mention names because there are many names that I'll miss out, but they were quite a lot. They're all economists. I think we definitely need lateral entry from other professions also. Uh, and we don't have enough of that. Now, how to do that? Well, look, you just make a decision that you know, you're know you going to... I mean, the simplest decision that you could make is that X percent of senior jobs in the government uh, would be open to lateral entry. I think your real problem will be that um, economists don't necessarily have a booming market outside. So there are a lot of economists who are quite happy to come into the government and sort of stay there. Other professions that have a booming market outside, they'll be quite interested in coming for a while, but then they leave. So if you recruit, as we are now doing, at the middle level, there are people who come for two years, three years, but then they get out. I think you need to do that not just at the middle level, but also at the top level. Uh, I mean, for example, if we were to decide uh, that, you know, 30% of the secretaries to the government of India will be recruited laterally, okay? I think this is the real problem that uh, you can probably attract people laterally to become secretaries. You may not be able to attract people laterally from the private sector to become additional secretaries because the structure in government is so hierarchical that, you know, they will, they, they will find it attractive to be a secretary but may not find it attractive to be an additional secretary for the simple reason that they don't want to be in government that long. I mean, all additional secretaries become secretaries, but that's for a person with a longer term horizon. So I think we, I'm quite clear that uh, the government is now moving into areas where a generalist just doesn't know what the situation is. I mean, for example, whether you look at telecom, uh, the whole digital transformation that's going on, you can't expect a generalist civil servant to understand that. Also, I think when it comes to regulators, the idea that we promote people from the civil service to make them regulators is, I think, uh, not right. Now, you know, in our time, there was no alternative because there was no private sector. I mean, if you're setting up a telecom regulator, uh, you would be the only fellows who had any experience of that were people in government. That's not true today. I mean, there are any number of companies, not any number, but any number of people in a few companies that actually have direct experience of how the telecom system works. So I think the, the regulators in many of these things need to be practitioners and not generalized civil, generalist civil service. This will be a problem because, you know, the generalist civil service, let me, I mean, since they're all my friends, I should also make their, their case. See, the generalist civil servants feel that it's very unfair uh, to recruit them into a profession where they have expectations of rising seamlessly to the top and then stop their rise by bringing in people laterally. 
you could overcome this problem by giving civil servants greater freedom to take up private sector jobs for a five-year period. So if they're any good, they'll be able to get private sector jobs. So, you know, the, the cost of entry will also imply a facilitation of exit. Even that, by the way, will be resented. But at least, at least people will, will feel that they're not being discriminated against. Uh, but it's, it's not easy. It's tough. And I think, but I'm clear uh, that we need to do this. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I enjoyed that. Thanks a lot.